Welcome to Food Allergy Canada's Listen and Learn series, where we cover off timely topics related to food allergy. These sessions connect you with experts so that you can hear firsthand about topics that matter to you. Please note, however, that these sessions are not intended to provide specific medical advice, and we encourage you to seek out the input of a board-certified allergist for questions specific to your own situation. I'm your host, Jennifer Gertz, Executive Director of Food Allergy Canada and mother of twin boys with multiple food allergies. We have a really interesting topic today, needle-free epinephrine for treating anaphylaxis. And we have a really great guest and a food allergy champion, Dr. Harold Kim. I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Kim over the past five years and most recently as the co-lead of the National Food Allergy Action Plan and am delighted that he's able to join us today on this very interesting topic. Welcome, Dr. Kim. Thank you, Jennifer. So Dr. Kim, you're a very credentialed healthcare professional in the food allergy space. And you know, before we dig into the topic, let's just learn a little bit about uh, yourself, your work in this area, and your interest in the epinephrine auto-injector space. So I work uh, clinically at Western and also in a private practice in Kitchener. And about probably about 15 years ago, a light bulb went off in my brain and I thought, you know, maybe there's some issues with our epinephrine injectors that we have available that may not be adequate for some of our patients. So that's when we started doing research, looking at uh, the, the needle length and, and the design of, of epinephrine with ultrasound studies. Uh, and, and, and since then, I mean, that's been, been an, an area of interest. We've done some studies on dosing of epinephrine in patients with allergic reactions. And, and I think um, um, importantly now, uh, we, we do a lot of um, food oral immunotherapy in our clinics and, yeah. and I think generally managing uh, patients with food allergy in Southwestern Ontario. Awesome. Well, it's a real delight to have you uh, join us today. Before we dig into, you know, this needle-free epinephrine, you know, let's set some context here. Most of us living with food allergy recognize the importance of epinephrine, uh, epinephrine auto-injectors, as we've got today. But let's just do a real quick review. You know, what is epinephrine and how is it used in the context of food allergy? So certainly most of us think about epinephrine as being a drug in the epinephrine devices and the injections we give in our clinics when patients are having reactions, but it's actually a hormone and neurotransmitter that exists naturally in our bodies. So what we're doing is we're actually giving a larger uh, a dose of epinephrine to, to manage allergic reactions. So essentially what happens with, with epinephrine is that um, when we're having a food reaction, we have symptoms of shortness of breath, low blood pressure, um, rashes, gut symptoms. And those symptoms occur mostly because there's leakage of, of fluid and blood, ves blood vessel dilation throughout our bodies. And essentially what epinephrine does is it reverses that. And quite quickly, usually within in minutes, um, we see patients improve when we give epinephrine. And it's because that it, it stops that, that problem that occurs after an allergic reaction starts with food exposure. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you. So um, on that, you know, using epinephrine and epinephrine auto injectors for reactions, you know, our organization has spent a considerable amount of time understanding the, uh, the bit of the published data around, are people using epinephrine auto injectors to treat anaphylaxis in community? And we realize that there's a big gap there because it's not consistently being used uh, before people go into the hospital. So I'd be interested in your perspective around, you know, what do we, what do we think are the barriers that uh, patients face uh, in managing anaphylaxis and kind of stepping in and, and being uh, willing to treat a severe allergic reaction with an epinephrine auto injector? Well, I think even with the education that we try to provide, and I think you tried to provide uh, to your uh, group in terms of all of the, the food allergy patients across Canada. Um, in spite of that, I think there's often a reluctance to use epinephrine, carry epinephrine even sometimes with our patients. And, uh, and certainly we don't know all of the reasons why, why that exists and why that happens. But I think one, one reason is that with the devices that we have available, 
and and we have uh, three uh, general devices that we have available in Canada. Um, they're great devices. I think they've um, saved a lot of lives in Canada over the last uh, 20 or 30 years, but they have some drawbacks. Um, the first drawback, I think, and most most patients, especially children and adolescents, will will tell you, and even many adults will say that the needle uh, is a problem, and just just the anxiety of injecting yourself with something is 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 quite uh, limiting for some people. The size of the devices, uh, some of the devices are are large and uh, are not easy to carry, certainly in your pocket. So uh, they have to be carried in in a backpack or purse. Um, and then there's some potential flaws with with um, you know the dosing, uh, the needle length in the devices, those sorts of things um, may lead uh, to an inadequate um, kind of understanding and and maybe a reluctance for patients, uh, like I said, to carry and sometimes even to use epinephrine. And and I can tell you anecdotally, um, when I when I do food immunotherapy, um, I actually give my my mobile phone number to all of our patients, um, and even patients that you think would be very, very comfortable giving epinephrine to themselves or to, to their child um, get quite nervous. And I can't tell you how many times I've been called and where I've had to coach uh, parents in terms of how to give uh, the epinephrine injector to hmm. their child while they're reacting. Um, and sometimes even, um, you know, um, patients that have had taken it before, but we have to kind of coach them through. So, so I think there is some comfort um, level that, that isn't reached for all of our patients. Okay, and do you think that um, also factored into that is this belief that it's got to be a really serious reaction because it seems pretty extreme to have to inject yourself with a needle? Yeah, that's that's a great point, and and uh, and so in in my opinion, and 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 I will admit that there's a broad range of opinions, even with us as as allergists, um, but I think we should be using epinephrine not necessarily for the severe, severe reactions, because uh, sometimes we don't want it to get that severe. If we give it early, we may prevent uh, the severe outcomes and severe symptoms. For example, uh, just last week, we were giving a child a food challenge in our clinic in London, and his symptoms were severe abdominal pain and one hive on his back. And the abdominal pain is certainly not gonna lead to life-threatening problems, but he was very uncomfortable. And so we give him a dose of epinephrine and in five minutes, his discomfort's gone. Mm. I think, um, you know, there, there's not just the life-threatening aspect. There's, there's the, the improvement in symptoms and comfort, uh, but certainly giving it early and may prevent the life-threatening uh, outcomes. So in my opinion, I, I encourage patients to use it relatively early uh, because right. I, I, think, I think it's the right way to go. Terrific. Okay. Yes. Prompt early use. It, it, uh, it, it certainly sounds like, and it certainly has for my son resolved symptoms quickly. So um, that, that's a good reinforcement of that. Now, over the last couple of months, um, there's been a, a, a news on the development of these needle-free epinephrine products for treating anaphylaxis. So it sounds exciting. It might help deal with some of those anxieties that people have around uh, using a needle. Can you tell us about this product innovation pipeline and, and perhaps some of the solutions that might, might be coming to the marketplace? There's, there's two delivery systems now, two general approaches that are different than injection uh, that uh, are now in development in the U.S. And it, it, it appears that one of the devices is quite quite close in terms of potentially getting through the FDA and, and on the market. So there's the nasal spray devices. And the one that I think is closest to coming to market is, is called Nephi. And there's um, a sublingual device that uh, releases epinephrine under your tongue. And so um, those two delivery modes are, are, are being researched and studied. Uh, the, the under the tongue or sublingual device probably is a few years away. Um, they're, they're kind of in earlier studies than the nasal device. Um, the nasal device um, looks promising. Uh, the, the company that has the device has done a few studies. Now the studies have been in, in healthy volunteers, but when they've compared uh, the blood levels and the heart rate and blood pressures of patients when they get the epinephrine delivered through the nose compared to injected um, into the muscle, with, uh, with an EpiPen, I, I think that was the main device they compared it to. 
and then they also used a needle and syringe. Um, the nasal delivery seems seems good. I mean, it's comparable in terms of um, serum levels. Uh, it was a little bit slower um, than the EpiPen to get to get up to maximum level, um, but still not bad. Um, and it did seem to have uh, an effect on on blood pressure and heart rate, um, like you'd expect with with epinephrine. Now, uh, remember these uh, these studies were done in healthy volunteers, not patients having anaphylaxis. So. Uh, exactly how they behave in patients um, having symptoms is not known yet, um, but certainly it seems promising. And, and as we've discussed, I mean, delivering it to the nose uh, may be um, preferred for many of our patients. So would that be like an inhalation through the nose? It would be a spray through right. the nose. Um, yeah. and, and, and so p potentially, and people have thought, well, you know, what if you have really bad allergies and your nose is blocked? Right. Will, will the drug get into the nose? And it looks like even if you have allergic rhinitis, um, the levels may be different than if, if you don't have nasal congestion, but it's, it seems to be absorbed. Um, so it, it's, it's literally a spray. Um, right now, the dosing for adolescents, adults is two milligrams. And I think they're gonna look at a lower dose for children with the nasal device. Um, so again, it looks very promising, and obviously, it must be promising if the FDA is is uh, seriously reviewing it. Right now, what about the sublingual thing? How does that how does that actually work? So the sublingual film is um, is is kind of it's literally like a film that you put under your tongue, and uh, we know that sublingual absorption of many drugs uh, is excellent, um, and and it appears that uh, the delivery and absorption of the sublingual film of epinephrine um, is, is effective. Um, so again, it's, it's much earlier in terms of the research compared to the nasal device, um, but it looks like it's promising as well. It looks like it, it leads to peak levels within around 12 minutes. Um, mm -hmm. So comparable to, uh, to the injector devices. Um, so again, I think early, early in development, but very promising. And you can imagine, um, you know, potentially the sublingual device delivery might even be preferred over the nasal delivery for some people. Right, right. So it's going yeah. to be, be nice to have some options. It's, it's going to be very good. Absolutely. Uh, options are always uh, welcomed by the community. Now, so in terms of any concerns, do you have some concerns around these different delivery systems that we should be thinking about? Yes, I mean, I think with any new product, certainly with, with a drug like epinephrine that is treating potentially a severe problem and could lead to severe side effects if, if, if too much is given, if the drug is, is given you know, in the wrong, um, in the wrong uh, tissue compartment, like for example, if, if uh, epinephrine is given intravenously versus in the muscle, you know, the, the way the drug behaves is very different. Hmm. So certainly none of us have had experience yet managing anaphylaxis with these devices. So I think it's going to take some time for us to become comfortable, um, you know, when to use it, how to use it, um, how, how good it is, how effective it is. And I think many of us probably will start using it in clinic settings, like when we do food challenges, aroma giving immunotherapy. Um, right. But I think we're going to need some experience. I think from an ethics point of view, it's very difficult certainly to start off research with the with the new product and patients suffering from anaphylaxis because we we would believe that that would be too risky now that right. being said um, remember that even um, the epinephrine injectable devices generally have not been studied um, in you know in anaphylaxis in a randomized or in a controlled manner um, you know we, we've done retrospective analysis of looking at at B 0.5 milligrams for reactions. And, and it seems to work, it seems to be safe. But again, it's not formal randomized controlled studies. Um, they're just not done with that because of the ethics issues. Right, right. That makes sense. And, and, I, and I, I like what you're saying about getting that experience in clinic as the allergist overseeing a reaction, because then you're, you're really equipped to help those patients if you felt like the efficacy of it wasn't working. So when, when, when you look at the data with the nasal devices, so re remember um, the uh, EpiPen has 0.15 and 0.3, Emirate has 0.3 and 0.5, and Allergect has 0 0.15, 0 0.3 milligrams. And the Nephi product has two milligrams. So that is about seven times uh, the dose of the standard EpiPen. Oh, so, okay. So in, in, 
in some patients, if, if you know, more drug is absorbed than typically absorbed, then it's possible that you may have um, you know, a greater impact on blood pressure, heart rate, maybe more, more side effects. Um, so again, I think we're gonna have to see um, how things pan out because generally in medicine, you know, the, the uncommon side effects come out when, when the drug's actually used you know, in, right. in society and not, not in the studies, but in, right. in what right. And obviously if they're using that type of dosing, then it doesn't absorb as fast through uh, the nasal. Is that, is that how that should be interpreted? I'm presuming that the companies have done, you know, preclinical studies where they've used different doses to see what levels and what right. impact they get on the body, the physiologic response. And, um, and I suspect they've come up with that dose, you know, thinking that for, for most people, um, that dose is going to be safe and lead to good serum levels. Great. Okay. Well, that's terrific. So, so what still has to happen for these products actually to, you know, uh, be given approval through FDA and make their way into Canada. What does that picture look like? So, um, so those of us that have been around long enough have seen, <laughs> have seen many products that just are on the verge of getting to us and, and don't make it to us. And it, it's very possible that this may happen with these products just to warn everybody. Um, so, Generally, what, what happens is that um, with products like this, they would be cleared in the US first. And, and, um, and so they would be cleared by the FDA and then they would be released uh, out to the market. Um, and then the, company, the companies would, would apply to Health Canada uh, to get their products cleared in Canada. Um, Health Canada would, would review all the science uh, behind their products and, and uh, have consultants um, kind of look at the products. And, and if, if Health Canada feels that, that it's uh, effective and safe, then they would then um, allow it to come onto the market in Canada. Um, and and um, with the injected injector devices, the newer ones, um, remember the, the EpiPen was already there and the injector devices are very similar. So my, my suspicion is, is that they got onto the market um, kind of more easily because they're, they're very similar to the, right. the happy pen. So remember that these devices are different. The doses are different. Uh, certainly the way they behave and are delivered uh, to us will be different. So Health Canada, I suspect, will take a little bit longer to, to evaluate these, uh, these products because of that, the, the fact that they're different. Terrific. Okay. Well, you know, it, at least it's got a positive trajectory. We'll take some time. It sounds like there's a few things that uh, uh, need to be established uh, through the U.S. and then in Canada before we might see that here. But nevertheless, is an exciting prospect uh, prospect for the future. I'd really like to thank you, uh, Dr. Kim, so much uh, for your time and your expertise. Um, we uh, we would love uh, to, to do another one of these down the road on perhaps another topic and engage you in the conversation on that. Before we close out, I'd like to thank our supporters of our Listen and Learn series, the Schroeder Foundation, the Sean Delaney Memorial Golf Classic, and the Peanut Bureau of Canada. And I'd also like to thank you for listening. Have a great day and stay tuned for future sessions in the months to come.